Hi Ketan, I can see you. I'm just sharing this in all the right places. Give me one second. Today I have the most incredible guest, entrepreneur, a TEDx speaker, an international speaker, author, trainer, coach. He does amazing work with the government. So I'm really, really excited to be interviewing Ketan today. So I'm just waiting for him to join the broadcast. He'll be with us in one second. Hey, hey. Ketan. How you doing? I'm really well. No introduction needed, but I just gave you an amazing introduction. No, thank thank you. you. Thank you for being a guest on Brilliant Speaker today. I really, really appreciate your time. No, thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an absolute honour. So, Ketan, let's get started with your questions. I'd like you to share a little bit about your story and what brings you into the speaking entrepreneur and being an international speaker. Uh, it's an actually interesting journey. I mean, I never, I never set out to be a speaker or actually I didn't even set out to be an entrepreneur, to be honest with you. I, I, I wanted to work all my life, be have a quite a safe job in a, in a great corporation and stuff like that. I lost my job in 2008 during the recession. Uh, started by going self-employed, um, started my first company. And I was asked um, at, at a point during the sort of transition of my first my first, um, my first, first company or, or, the, or selling my first company to come out and um, share um, some insights and intelligence with, with a corporation. Um, it's really quite interesting because the first, the first actual speaking gig that I got, I was, uh, mm. pumped, ready to go, really excited, jumped on stage, ripped the, the inner scene of my trousers right between my crotch, uh, and had to sort of fold my legs or have them twisted basically while I was speaking. Um, the show must go on. I did that talk, um, right at the end when we got to Q and A. Someone asked me, did I need to go to the toilet? And then that's when I came out with the brutal honesty that just, in my excitement, ripped my trousers. Um, as a point of that, got me in, um, into sort of speaking from a very natural kind of way. I was there to just really present some facts. But, I, I um, you know, what I think the audience was really compelled by was my... Um, me being human on stage, you know, the, the funny stories, the, the whole anecdote of the fact that I ripped my trousers and it's almost like a stand up show to a certain extent. And that kind of got me into, into, into speaking. And I thought to myself, Oh, okay. Well, it seems all right. I'll do it again. And, uh, started to, um, get, you know, offer myself out as more as a keynote speaker for other companies um, started to sort of push myself out um, across other different opportunities, going to different shows and other people's events, and 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 the rest is history from there, I guess. Today's a lot more different compared to to the first time when I ripped those trousers on stage. Um, you know, we, you know, I, I plan a disrupt talk, disruptive talks tour every year. Try and last year was a great; it was one of the best. Um, um, events uh, or years that I've had to, uh, you know, 42 cities, 250 talks, um, audiences over a quarter of a million, um, you know, spent eight months on the road. It was almost like I was, uh, I was in a rock band doing a tour, you know, that, 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 that's what it really, really felt like. So yeah, that's, uh, it all started from someone just asking me to come in and share some insights and me ripping my trousers. <laughs> Well, that's what I call making an entrance and being remembered, <laughs> Ketan. So well done for that. I think you planned it. <laughs> um, 
I really like your points on adding humour on the stage. I think that's a great point. And also being yourself, it's so important to be yourself because people will see that you're authentic and being the real version of yourself. So that was another great point too, Ketan. Yeah, I just, I just want to add a very quick bit in there. I think even with authenticity, just go away from the grain. People people want you on stage. They want you. They, You know, the information is only... Uh, a, cer a certain part of this you know you are the vessel rather than you know and the message is coming through you as a vessel so being yourself is probably one of the most the most important things that you could ever do um you know i've had situations where people have been falling asleep in the audiences or i thought they're falling asleep but actually they're just closing their eyes and imagining while i'm talking uh right the way through to to, to people crying, you know, and that's made me emotional on stage as well. And it's not about me trying to be me. I just I just get on and say, look, I'm a human just like you. I'm going to share and uh, share my insights, share uh, share my facts, share all the information. But we do it from a storified perspective rather than this whole um, stale, sterile PowerPoint kind of um, kind of presentation environment that it is the more you you can tell a story the more people are going to get engaged well i know from first-hand experience because i come to change your game um event and yeah. the stories you were telling were amazing <laughs> and you really do grip the audience so i know from first-hand experience what a good speaker you are too so that's a little compliment for you um, Thank let's you. get on to that. Let's get on to our next question. Now, you're very open about it. You've been through a big life change. And I love the fa fact that you're sharing your story. You're being honest about the change you've been through. And that personally really inspired me that you've been an open book and wearing your heart on your sleeve. Can you share with the audience what you've been through the change? <laughs> Well, it's yeah, and I really appreciate uh, you for saying that. It's it's um, it's not often easy. It's not as easy as people think to to really just come forth and and really be open and honest. I think sometimes, and I'm gonna I'm, I'm a disruptor by nature, so you know I'm gonna play on the edge. Sometimes people play up to this whole thing about change, but there is a raw honesty. Uh, there is a there is a threshold and a line that one will cross and. You can feel that in the in the energy and the shift in there in, in people's energy when when especially if you hear them live. So um, I guess really what you're talking about from from my perspective, as I say, having lost my job or becoming a victim of redundancy during the 2008 crash, I went through a supersonic uh, speed um, period in my time where um, I I got what we call untold success. You know, I managed to start a business, sell it to a former dragon from Dragons Den. Um, I started work with, working with uh, governments, ministers, royal family, celebrities. Um, my businesses were doing quite well, you know, year on year with different things. And I guess my ego was, you know, building itself up. Um, a lot of what was happening within me, un, unknown to myself, was about narcissism. It was it was all narcissistic behavior, the, the touch points, the way I felt about particular things, the way I would behave in, in particular environments, the way I would see particular things. Um, we just talked about the fact that I give, you know, I do a lot from a sustainability point. And I try and give back as a lot. So I'm not saying that, you know, I, I'm pure evil in that respect or I'm pure selfish in that respect. Um, and I've, um, I got this opportunity to, to uh, one thing that I have in my bucket list is that I like to go to at least three places in the world that I've never been to every year. And Phoenix came up last year in my um, in my agenda, uh, in my tour. And I got asked to come to speak at an event called Meltdown in the Desert. And um, it's I don't speak as much in the US as, as I do in other parts of the world. And I thought this is an opportunity that I have to grab. Plus, the guy behind it is someone that I have mass love for. Um, anyway, uh, all these kind of things have been built to a certain level. You know, I feel to myself, I've always been put, you know, spotlights been put on me. I've been put on a pedestal. Um, I own things in that respect. I, th this is the arrogance that you have within, within you with that kind of edge of ego. Um, until I got to this event, uh, Mark, um, 
I got to this event and something was niggling me. Something just wasn't right. Um, and when I mean wasn't right, it wasn't right about the event or anything. So something just didn't sit well with me. Um, I was amongst, you know, I was in the audience with 300 other people and I didn't feel like I was with them. I just felt like I was on my own. Um, when when things were happening, you know, I couldn't connect to a certain level with with what was going on. And actually, when it got to my turn to, to speak, I'd just been interviewed by Entrepreneur Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine were going to do a feature on their Facebook as a live while I was talking. Everything was set and my ego was booming high. I'm like, Entrepreneur Magazine doing this? Come on, I might not make the front page of the magazine, but I'm going to go live. Millions are going to watch me. And um, just as they walk through, this is this is what happened. You know, the power, the power went off on uh, in, in 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 the auditorium. From there, the power um, not only went off in the auditorium, it went across six blocks. They had to cancel that that part of it. They they reshuffled it. I had to come back and then give a talk, um, literally with no 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 presentation, nothing. All it, all I had was a battery operator, operated spotlight. Um, and I'll be honest with you, Mark, it was one of my rawest performances. I've never cried on stage myself, um, ever. You know, I felt emotion, but I've, I've trembled. I've, I've been shaking, but I've never, ever um, shed a tear in this respect. And I started telling a story based with so much emotion. You know, I don't know what flipped in my mind or what flipped in my body at that moment in time. Um, but the audience resonated with it. I mean, imagine just one spotlight in the dark on your face and you've got 300 people with their cameras out, you know, trying to bring out the light. It's almost being at a, like a um, uh, like a Robbie concert for crying out loud. You know, it, it was just a surreal feeling. After 20 minutes of intense pouring your heart out, you know, literally even the, the voice was trembling. I knew I'd broken something. Something had broken within me. And... Um, but I just still couldn't put my finger on it. Um, so I thought to myself, it's better rather than try and search for the answer to let the answer come and find me. Um, I decided to stay on and do, rather than doing what most speakers do is finish, get off stage and then off you go. Um, I stayed on. I, I, you know, I wanted to connect with people. I wanted to engage with people. I got a chance to meet a, a lovely little girl called Neva Reckler Lee. Uh, her parents, um, Dawn and Justin, have, um, are going to. We're going to be all together again this year. In fact, next week I go back to Meltdown. Um, Neva's only seven, and uh, Neva's already had three companies. You're running three companies, and she has this um, this whole inspiration of, in, or, or, or this whole vision of it's inspiring a million young people to do whatever they want to do. And I mean, young is under. 13 year old you know people find their superpowers and stuff like this and her parents heard me in the you know while I gave this talk and they immediately reached out and she said you're talking from a frequency that most people won't understand but we understand you and we just want you to spend some time with Neve uh Neva and just talk to her she's having a few problems I'm like yeah sure why not normally the the other side of me would have just said I'm sorry I don't have time for this but this, something about me was just making me create more time. I left Phoenix in a little bit of a fuzz. Um, it was about ten and a half hours on the way back to London. I didn't sleep. I didn't drink any alcohol. I didn't watch any in-flight movies. I just spent ten hours just trying to figure out what the hell had just happened. Um, and when I got back, um, I had all the answers. I'd been writing, writing, writing. I mean, this isn't writing for writing in a book. This is literally scribbling, swearing into a book, doing all sorts of different things just to e exhaust everything out of my mind and out of my heart. But I knew, I knew something had, you know, a wire had broken or a string had changed. Um, I knew that um, it's no longer about me. It's ne never about me anymore. It's about the stuff around me, my attitude towards my business changed, the, my attitude uh, towards the people in my business changed, the attitude towards what we achieve in my business has changed. I, longer, I was no longer the epicenter of my company. I, I, I am now basically just someone who sort, started something up and my role in life was to be more, um, be more supportive to other people 
who are in that company, driving the company. And it's not a, a it's not a kind of like a rags to riches story, but let me tell you something. When um, when you when you understand that really, and when you understand truly what why it should be like this, things change and change very fast. Um, in that period uh, of kind of leaving June last year, to I went through this whole kind of rediscovery of who I am as a person, and I don't mean this kind of uh, self to righteous path. I, I'm talking about toxicity. I was sitting there trying to eke every inch of toxicity out. In this period, in this time, I quit smoking after 22 years. Um, literally, just smoked my last cigarette. And no, no uh, desires, no, no cravings, nothing. Just off that, I my alcohol intake came down. I started to listen and become more reactive to to other people's thoughts before mine. Um, things just naturally were changing. It's not something that I was, um, I planned. It's not like, okay, I'm going to do this, then I have to do this. It was just as it came, I was taking on. People are like, how the hell can you just one day be smoking and next day just stop? I don't say I don't say it's a mindset thing. I just think it was this whole attitude. The, the, the whole attitude within me changed, the spirit had changed. Everything was kind of moving itself along. Within by by the end of October, early sort of November, I decided that we needed to change things within the organisation, bring more people on, um, and I mean at a higher level. I wanted to step away from my company and have other people that want to drive it forward. Today, um, I have a business that has a board of um, a board around me. I only work on the things that I want to work on. My focus in life is to only work with and help my guys achieve what they need to achieve, um, you know, to, to be successful. Um, and th this all comes down to this one trigger point in change in my life. And, and it's always been in the fact that, you know, for years I've, I've believed that um, I've had to look after myself. No one else is out there to, to watch out for me. And yes, I have to be good at what I do, but that doesn't mean that your ego needs to tell the world that you are, the greatest at this i think the most humblest people like david beckham you know he's someone that i aspire to i've had the privilege of meeting and maybe doing a little bit of work behind the scenes with you know this guy is an amazing talent that's so humble it just it it, it it just changes the whole perspective of things and that's what i've gone through i've gone through this major change and shift in my in my own personal world success is one thing being connected to royalty you know around the world presidents uh, prime ministers working with all these kind of things this is really great from the face front but when you get to that point when you get to that point in your life where you know you've been doing all this stuff to satisfy what and and the very thing that you wanted in life you is pushing yourself away that freedom that that love that flexibility the hours that you've committed into your trade um, and sacrifice with your family. The fact that you know you've got young kids who have just understood the fact that daddy's not at home. He's gonna he's gonna be traveling the world, and you're doing it for all these other people. Really, when you get that question of yeah, like I just said, it, last year was amazing. Two hundred, you know, two hundred fifty talk, forty two cities, but for what? I've inspired a quarter of a million people around the world, but what have I taken away from that myself personally? That's really gonna help me and the people around me so this kind of major contrast change has really been uh, for me has been about what am i doing this for why am i doing this um, and there is a greater force out there and that greater force can only be impacted if i have the power to change um, i can't expect anyone in in their life to ever change if i can't change myself um um, I, you know, it's the whole, it's the whole process of practice what you preach. And I, I'll be quite frank, guys, for anyone out there that's listening to this right now, a lot of us that get on stage don't even practice half the stuff that we preach. So this, this is, this isn't a new me. This is the evolved me. This is this, this is the me that's been trying to uh, jump out for a long time, but has felt very intimidated because of how I would be received and. Um, when people say to you that you speak from a higher frequency, it means that most people won't really understand what you're trying to say, but just say what you've got to say, because eventually they will. 
so that's that's one of the biggest shift changes for me it's been it's been great i can't stop smiling today you know i can't smile, stop smiling every day I, I my days are the way i want them i'm actually living the life that i want um and that all comes down to being really really honest with yourself and it's hard guys if you're trying it's brutally hard and you've got to you've got to tie yourself up and you've got to be really really honest brutally honest with yourself about what you're doing what you're not doing where you want to go and what you think you are compared to what you are so it's not just a reflection of yourself in the window it's not about going out and asking anyone's opinion if you don't understand your own opinion of yourself then how would you expect to to onboard anyone else's opinion of you it's changed my whole behavior i'm not so much on social media today i'm become a bit more of a private person i celebrate my successes in different ways um i don't have to um, shout from the 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 you know from the top highest pedestals of the highest mountains about all my achievements i don't need to compete with anyone because today it's no longer about me now it's it's about everything else that that's happening around me and it's changed our life goals my company is now more focused now as as because i i am the vision you know to be to to drive more sustainability to work on things like the un sustainability goals i want to be able to go out and leave a legacy uh, not because it's me it's because it's important for the future of where my kids are going you know when my kids are coming into a world which which i want to make sure that i have had a part to play um for them to have all the stuff that they they would need to succeed in life really so it might sound a little bit odd it might sound a little bit weird but um but that's that's me you know this is this is where i am we've gone from from a world of um survival when i lost my job and necessity to a uh, a level of greed which has been based on ego and success and being mode around and having to be in the in the in the environments of people who who most people won't be able to connect with to actually becoming more of the person that says okay you know having the shiny things and the great things in life is one important thing but where is life's value and and you know where where is your value the amount of toxicity that i put into my body not just from uh alcohol and nicotine or anything like that but just other things you know gossip ego all of these kind of things drip by drip it's 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 exuding itself and every day um as one drip remain uh, uh, leaves my body or leaves my environment another drip of sanity purity and 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 just pure um enjoyment kind of fits itself in So if any of you out there are going through a process where you feel sorry for yourself my advice is first stop feeling sorry for yourself look at the perspective of why something's happening is happening for a reason most of the time we feel sorry for ourselves but actually we should be kicking ourselves back first to to understand it's is the very thing that you didn't do 3 4 5 6 months back which is affecting you today and i'm not asking you to beat yourself up about it it's get over it move to the next level and understand that there's always going to be more than one answer to any one question don't let anyone in life tell you this is the only way you can do something choose find your own path do it the way you want to do it it doesn't matter whether it takes you a day or it takes you your whole life but as long as you are on that journey to change you know there you will find that the law of attraction the magnetism the people that come in and out of your life everything will be there for that particular reason and right now for me everyone that's coming in they you know i can only see the best in things everyone that wants to work on things i can only see the best in things why because i've cleaned my ego it's not about me anymore it's it's more about what we can do together Well, I take my hats off to you for sharing that message. You must keep sharing this message, Ketan, because in the business world, there's so many big e- egos. You're not on your own with narcissistic traits. It's everywhere. And any viewers with narcissistic traits, dig deep like Ketan 
have some balls and dig deep and yeah. face your inner demons and come from a good place and go inside and go back to being coming from authenticity. I think, I think, being... Yeah, you're you're absolutely right, Mark. I think do you know for me what probably the best way to describe this is go back to when you were a kid. Honestly, even if you did bad things when you were a kid, you did that with no no malice, no 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 bad intention. It was just it was just what it is. Um I think the excitement of being able to you know, all this kind of part of life, I think what what life does throw at us is convention and I'm very much about this whole thing about disruption, changing the way that you do things to elicit a change in result. Um and believe me, um, especially if you're a coach, you're a consultant, you're an expert, you're out there, you're, you're speaking on stage. I think had I not had, had that power cut not come, had, you know, in Phoenix, had I not had the opportunity of just being put in front of a battery operated spotlight, I don't think I would ever have given my rawest per per performance ever. Today, I don't go on any stages without knowing that I'm going to speak from my heart rather than my head. I'm not there to educate anyone. I'm there to just tell a story. If you're inspired, you're inspired. If you're, if you're, if you reject it, you reject it. My sole purpose is I know there's something in every person's story that everyone in that audience can relate to. So rather than trying to give a hundred percent of inspiration, just try one. Just try that one percent because, and just if if you can connect with one percent, a one person in that audience, you've done your job. You've done your job. That's more than anything that can ever happen because that ripple effect that you have on those person, the amount of people that I've had over the years that come back and say, "I heard you speak at a particular event. I did this. Okay, I didn't do it straight away, but you were right." Or, I don't want to know that I'm right. I just want to know that people can uh, can feel um inspired to do something with you know with the story that we've you know we've been able to tell and mark that's what it's all about you want to be a brilliant speaker don't worry about your tonality don't worry about your pitch your pace your execution your your facts worry about the story that you're going to tell because if you can tell the story everything else doesn't matter it takes guts. I hope more people follow your lead and I really hope you keep on sharing this message because it's so powerful, so so current and I know there is a lot of big egos out there. I really hope people follow your lead and, and go inside. So let's get to our next question. My next question yeah. is, what advice have you got for aspiring speakers or established speakers that are feeling stuck to make progress, to start making money in their speaking businesses and to turn it into a business? Okay. So um, it's it's probably the $64 million question, I guess, you know, in this. Um, I never set out to make money out of speaking. I think it came and found me. That's one of the things. And I think there is a large percentage of your audiences and the people out there that are forcing themselves to become a professional speaker that need to actually sit back and think to themselves that actually you don't need to make the living out of the speaking. It's let the speaker, let the speaker make a living out of you in that respect. And what I mean by that is having different products and services. You could be a, as a, a consultant, a coach, an expert. I mean, you think about how many professional athletes after they finish their careers go into motivational speaking and stuff like this, or after dinner speaking. That's not a career. It's just it's just something that kind of blends through. Remember, it's that whole story, the, the whole story part. Now, there is a difference between a speaker and a professional speaker, okay? Um, someone who wants to create a, a business out of speaking needs to understand um, that it's not them. It's not about them. It's the stories that they're bringing. It's the mission that they're pushing forward. And it's their execution that's getting them their job. A stand-up comedian that doesn't have new jokes or new um, uh, whatever acts or whatever they call it eventually is going to become tired and become extinct. So rule number one that I have, and I have three rules into this, if you're going to become a professional speaker, number one is perfect your craft, okay? 
Um, what is it, you know, pick one particular area that you're going to speak about, whether it's disruption, whether it's innovation, whether it's about recovery, if it's, don't try and be a speaker for all different types of occasions. You can't, I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm an inspirational speaker. It's different. I'm, you know, um, the Brad Burtons of the world, you know, a good friend of mine, he is a motivational speaker, you know, um, Tony Robbins, a motivational speaker. Okay, I'm an inspirational speaker. What am I? I'm there. My speaking is, um, or what I speak about is all about to inspire you, not to motivate you. It's to get you thinking differently. So understand the craft of where you're going. Be very, very linear or specific or niched into those particular areas. The second thing is, is you need to be more, um, more related to the story and and what you're doing as a performance so you become understand how to master the art of the performance as opposed to master the art of the message um, because different audiences require different levels of performances so think to yourself about the the kind of person who would be on a, um, a, a, a you know a london theater production day in day out mm -hmm. same type of performance you know, and why? Because that's the job that they have to do. They have to, they have to elevate themselves. They have to bring something to life. And this is the natural aura of a speaker. A speaker takes, you see, an animator takes um, drawings and brings things to life. They tell a story through that very nature of animating. Um, a, a blogger uh, talks about or brings something into life through the power of the words that they put in. A speaker it's the narrative. So it's very much about understanding what is it that you bring into life and how is your performance going to be skewed, uh, scaled up. Um, you know, the third area that I then talk about is don't push or don't have the expectation of high fees. There are, you know, when I started out and speaking, um, I never charged because I didn't know what to charge. I didn't know how to charge. I didn't understand it, any of this. So I used to just go and tell the stories. I've probably done some of my best gigs and never paid, for, you know, never got paid for them. But it's part of the, understand it's part of your learning cycle. It's like you investing on a training course. You're, the best feedback you're ever going to get, the best learning curve is going out on stage and telling a story and seeing the feedback. Yeah, there is no speaker out there that can train you to be, speak like them because you can't speak like them. You can only use those kind of performances. So I think to myself, rather than getting paid 200 quid, if I could go into that audience, uh, and go in front of that audience and get feedback on how my speaking is, it's probably uh, a, it's a great return on, on investment for me. The second element of it is, is start to negotiate in particular ways. Think of being more practical in the fact of getting on, on as many stages as you can to tell your story in a way where people maybe just cover your costs, like your travel or maybe an accommodation or anything like this. So you don't charge a fee. You, 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 you start this way. And I think you have to slowly build yourself up just like um, the audiences. Why is it that one person can charge 10,000 for a talk? And why is it some people can't even cha uh, charge 10 pounds for a talk? Most people are chasing the money. They're not chasing the, 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 the story. So they will go out and offer their services to any particular person out there that's willing to pay that's wrong guys you've got to go in if you've got your niche you go into that market stay in your lane be become the best because if i said to you name um mark name me a funny comedian that you, you you like name me a funny do you know any comedians just what's if i said funny comedian what's the first person that comes to your head frank skinner <laughs> frank skinner why frank skinner that was just the first one that popped up. <laughs> but Frank Skinner has been crafting his trade. Now, Frank Skinner has a, compare Frank Skinner to someone like Michael McIntyre, two very different comedians, but two very successful comedians, okay? Stays in their lane, does the production in their particular way. Now, you know these people. You've got to create yourself as a brand to a certain extent. So when they, the next person that says your name, will resonate with a particular speaking style and stuff like this. So if you are starting yourself out, yes, it's going to be tough, but everything's tough. Every job is tough. You've got to start from the bottom, work yourself up. You don't, don't look at all these freebie speaking gigs as, um, as something where people are exploiting you. 
take it as an opportunity saying, I'm going to go and learn what I'm not doing right in the audiences. How can I get to an almost 95% satisfaction rate of this? Believe me, if you can do that, you will find people in that audience that will want you to go and speak at their events. Okay. The second thing is don't be greedy. Okay. Be supportive of your kind of guys. When I started to first book my own, um, so I book my own speaker tour, right? I don't, I don't, I don't get anyone. I haven't got a speaker agency. They don't get me anything. People approach me. I do my own negotiations. Everything's kind of set up. In some cases, what do I do if I'm asked to go and speak at a conference internationally? I'm like, okay, you want me on stage for 45 minutes. Okay, I'll do that. What else can I do for you? What else can I, is there a private talk you want me to do to your sponsors? This Become a little bit more supportive of it. Don't just become a prima donna and say, I'm here for 45 minutes and I'm going to leave. Stay on, support them. Why? Because you build your greatest connections there because the next time they do that event, you can contact and say, would you like me to come up again? Do you want me to do something else? The amount of repeat bookings that I've had is based on that particular thing. And then the third element of it is, is if you stay in your lane, you become a specialist at what you talk about and understand where your niche is, you don't need um, to really push the boat any further. I mean, I've gone from um, giving talks away for free, almost paying for myself to be on stages, you know, paying the travel, the accommodation, um, to, to being given 15 grand to do a 25 minute talk. So, um, it's going to, fl- it's going to fluctuate. So if you're starting out, you've got to get into the trade, you've got to get into the circuit. This is your time. Create that channel, carve it out. What is it that you're going to be a great, want to be known for in, in talking? Cause if you just look at the stand up comedians in the world and all these kind of inspiring, uh, the people that talk that you, that speak that you're kind of inspired by, They've all got one little thread, one little channel that they focus on. Well, some absolute gold there, Ketan, real gold, as in keeping your content current, staying in your lane, niching yourself down. I can't even think of all of it because you've just (laughs) blew me away with some great, great tips there. Honestly, that's some great goal there for new aspiring speakers or established speakers that are feeling stuck you've walked the walk you taught the talk and i really like your honesty too so that's absolutely great no yeah and and, and that's the other thing i think you bring a really good point there mark honesty honesty about how can you relate the subject to your own life experience Uh, because i think no one else can better tell the story of you than you and that's where the circle of authenticity comes from in the first place. That that whole thing of being authentic is it's not about, OK, you know, you don't have to have had problems in your life to be an authentic speaker. You don't have to be authentic, but uh, sorry, you don't have to have gone through those kind of things. You could have had a really uh, plush life. But the fact of it is speak from your own experiences. Don't speak from someone else's experiences. That's the only way that it's going to work. Absolute gold dust. Um, so I seen you speak at Change Your Game and your techniques really did blow me away. And obviously you saw me in the private group doing obviously the micro goals and reverse engineering. So I've started putting those practices in. And I mean, you may have seen my development just in two months, how, how I'm developing so fast from using some of those techniques. So my next question is, Ketan, can you give us a takeaway for business success, a good takeaway to create business success? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So the number one thing about to understand here, guys, is business. It's business success, not personal success. Okay. So um, there are, you know, we uh, at Enterprise Lab and on a number of things that we talk about the mindset within a business, you know, within entrepreneurs and, and stuff like this, you've got to know that if you're going to go into business, um, Business is all about building systems and processes which involve others that will bring the scalability, not yourself. So whatever it is that you're doing that's working, you've got to systemize that. Okay, number one. Number one, system, uh, number two is that systemization then needs to be trained into others that will be able to magnify or multiply that. 
that process. And for you, it, the biggest thing is going to be about the ego of you. you it, just because you're not in the business doesn't mean the business can't run. Okay. A lot of people get caught in that trap where they think without me, it won't work. But do you see Richard Branson doing that? Do you see um, most successful Lord Sugar, all these kind of people doing that? Are they the ones on the, you know, the bottom of the line actually doing this on the face front? No. So the first thing that I'm going to say to you guys is no matter what your business is in, whether it's in speaking, whether it's in consultancy, experts, coaching, whatever it needs to be. First thing that I want you to realize is if you are successful, and what I mean by that is if you can get one client to buy your product, guess what? You've got a system. Now, the secret is how do I get myself out of that system and get others to build that system? Your business is only going to succeed if you start to build systems, not build solutions. Okay, the more you take yourself out of the business, the more you have a business, the more you start to move towards an investor mindset, which is really much about how do I make my money make money is when when you know that you've got yourself a successful business. Now, I don't want you to think about how can I afford resources or, you know, uh, where would I find these people? The first thing you've got to understand is what is it that you did? that got that customer to give you that money, that client to give you that money in exchange for your services. Because whatever it is that you did, it worked. And that is the first part, stepping to your systems. So systems, people, resources, and then um, how do you make your money and your network work for you? Incredible again, Ketan. Real tips of advice. I'd like you to touch on reverse engineering a bit if you've got time to, because <laughs> yeah, that is absolute gold dust. <laughs> okay. Oh uh, yeah. Um, uh, actually, you're, you're you're the you're probably the the fourth interview today that's asked about reverse engineering. So that's interesting. Um, yes, reverse engineering. Um, so guys, reverse engineering is all about looking into the future, understanding what it is that you want as an end result, and working yourself backwards. There are four key steps to, to reverse engineering. Step number one is very much about visualization and vision. You've got to understand and be very clear about what it is that you want your business or whatever it is that you want to reverse engineer to look like. Now, this whole process is, what is built on Japanese business modeling. It's the way that Japanese um, businesses and entrepreneurs model themselves forward. They look into the future. They carve out this vision and then they work them way, uh, way backwards. So once you have that vision, and I mean, it needs to be quite clear. It can't just be, I want a business. I want a business in this industry doing this, working like this, having this many employees. It has to have, you know, it, it, I what, what does my life look like? What am I doing, um, you know, once, once this business is up and running, et cetera, et cetera. So once you have that vision set out, you then need to start applying what we call meat to the bone. And this is through KPI. So stage two is very much around uh, understanding your key end games, your key performance indicators. So it's, you know, on what day, by which date is this vision going to be manifested? Um, you know, what's the revenues in the business? How many employees do you have? What sort of contracts do you have? What are your clients? Uh, what level of clients? Where have these clients come from? Where are your managers from? Who's doing what? What are you doing in your business on this particular day? This is how fine you've got to go down with the information. Once you actually have these uh, these kind of KPIs built into place, you then start need to, you need to start engineering. So stage three is very much about engineering success in reverse. So we know that this is the end goal. We know that, um, and what you want to do is start creating these small milestones back to where you are today okay um and then the fourth uh, the fourth side of this is very much around taking all that information all that intel that you have and creating your plan see a lot of people do strategic planning and what planning does is planning forces you to stand where you are at today's point and and look forward what reverse engineering does is it gets you to look forward and and not plan backwards but actually make that path create that path which will include pivots which means that what happens is rather than having unexpected humps in the road now 
you actually understand that there is going to be a bit of uncertainty in a different area, but you have contingencies for these. Now, when you can do things like this, this is when you see these slick operations. So I think when I was talking to, with Beju earlier today, I kind of re related it to Ocean's Eleven. Anyone that watched the film, the, the slick comic, you know, crime caper of Ocean's Eleven, how slick is that plan? Everything goes off without a hitch. Why? Because they reverse engineer. They look into the future. They bring all these things down. They understand that if things are going to, things are going to, might go wrong at point seven. So we've got 7A, 7B, 7C as an opportunity, okay? And this is when things become quite interesting. Most people think, oh, I was lucky that I was in the room with the right person at the right time. No, that was premeditated. That was already designed. So reverse engineering is very much about preempting, understanding, and premeditating your processes. So whenever you take your first step forward, you're looking at what's in front of you rather than what's ahead of you. It's so, so different about that. It's, you know, you want to keep looking at stage one because, you know, you don't have to worry about stage seven because stage seven has already been planned for you because it's come as a part of your reverse engineering. Um, one tip here, if you do try this process, um, is that if you can answer over 20% of all the questions, you're not doing reverse engineering right. It's such a hard process to undertake because there are questions of uncertainty where, you know, if I asked you, um, what kind of manager have you got in your business at the end of the, uh, you know, at your target date? Um, you could you could describe that. But if I said, where did you find them from? You're like, well, I don't know where they came from. But it's not ask the question is not asking you to specifically answer where did they come from. It's asking you where could you find these people from, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's from there, here, here. Because what that does is it narrows down your 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 focus on the process. So um, to give you a very quick example about this, guys, um, and this is something that I talked about at uh, the Change Your Game event um, that was taking place. Um, about a year ago, we started to think about um, expanding our operations into other countries, and Thailand was on the horizon. The only reason Thailand came into my horizon because I knew that um, I had to go this year to go and speak at um, in Thailand. And I thought it'd be really good to, to see if we can do some work on that side. So what I looked at is said, where would we like to be in, within 12 months of, uh, you know, of this time moving forward? Um, and we set out a goal to say, we either want to be working with institution, institutions, um, the ecosystem to a particular uh, point with startups, or maybe working with institutions. We didn't really know exactly what it looked like at that stage. We just knew that these are the areas that we could or would like to potentially work in. And I started this whole process of reverse engineering back to the day that, um, you know, the day that I was there, uh, you know, that current day uh, when I was making uh, all of this strategy and plan. And as a part of this, I, I knew that there were certain things that I needed to do. And Beiju talks a lot about micro goals. For those of you that don't know, Beiju Solanke, the founder of On Spirit, talks a lot about micro goals, which are these goals uh, where, I, where you have 100% control over. And um, this is how I kind of set myself out. You know, so the plan, the way I reverse engineered it quite quickly, because I know sort of time is going, is I decided what I need to do is get first the attention of key people. These key people I need to be in a room with. These people, when I have them in the room, I need to be able to get some sort of agreement from them that, that we could work together. Then I need to be able to propose, then I need to finalize, then I need to contract, and then I need to, I'll be able to serve. So that's how, so I started with a serve and I worked all the way back to that proposal. And to cut a long story short, uh, I knew I was going in March. So by February, I'd already submitted these proposals to key individual players. who I knew the, digi the Minister of Digital and Society is going to be present at this event and we were going to be together in the same room having a coffee. My job in life then was not to go up and speak to him, but for him to recognize who I was. And that's what happened. Uh, I walked into that room, immediately turned around, the guy turned around and said, I mean, he knows who I am. He read my report and he felt that we needed to speak. And I said, let's have this over coffee. We signed an intent to supply. Six weeks later, we put proposals on the table. Another four weeks later, we've got an MOU with the Thai government. And uh, later this year, we actually initiate our first rollout of a program to support 
in over the next eight years, 5,000 SMEs to grow their businesses by 5x in 12 months. So anything is possible, guys, through reverse engineering. Um, if you can extend yourself out, if you start to look beyond where you are today and really, really put that clear vision of what you want to achieve within that time period, come back and build a plan and understand that it's not the plan that's your process, uh, that the, that plan can change, p things can pivot. But what will happen is that you'll be prepared You're gonna because everything's premeditated. It doesn't matter when that hump in the road comes. Why? Because you knew that hump is on its way and you know that you can either go left, go right or go over. Whatever it is, you've got the strategy to overcome that hump. And that's the difference. And that's why more, more businesses and more professionals and more entrepreneurs that use things like reverse engineering are going to be able to achieve what they want to achieve and succeed than those that actually use a part of it or, or ignore it completely. That's so valuable, Ketem, because it's like the law of attraction, but with the missing steps. So you're going into your future, going into detail with it, coming back to your present moment and taking small daily actions. Yes. Like it, with you, you, you wrote all the letters, even though you hadn't got that opportunity, you made that opportunity by writing those proposals out in detail and really going in depth, even yeah. though that opportunity but, 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 wasn't the there. That, exactly. The thing with that, my, uh, Mark, is, is that um, I knew what questions I needed to answer. So the whole point of this is you want to get someone's attention. Don't look up where they are today, but look up what's important to them. So I looked at it. I studied the, the Minister of Digital and, and Society. I studied what their values are, what they wanted to do, uh, what they want to achieve in the next five years. And that's what my proposal had because it was premeditated for him and him only. We sent it to a load of people, but he was the only guy that was going to be in the room. He's the only guy that I needed to connect with. And is this is this is the whole process of where how do you get someone who's above you or, or, you know, to come to you rather than you having to go to them. And that's how the reverse engineering part works. We, knew, we understood that he wants to create sustainability in an area. We knew that he wanted to create growth. So we produced a proposal, which was, it was premeditated to answer these questions or intrigue or pique his interest in a particular way. All, all we wanted from that part of the strategy is just to get him to come and speak to me. Once that was done, I wasn't greedy. I wasn't looking to get a contract with him in minutes. It was more of a, okay, can we now get to the stage where all we got want is to sign an intent to supply? That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to give us anything. It just means that there's an intent. I was only in Bangkok for four days, you know, but in four days to come back with an intent to supply from a government, took that was the critical point. With, if that didn't happen, everything pivots again. So the assurance, and, and this is what people want from you, right? People want assurance. They want confidence. They want believe you, that you believe in your abilities. It doesn't come from looking from a standing point forward. It comes from knowing what the future is and coming back. Because if I let you go on that, in that DeLorean right now and get to the 88 miles or whatever it is, and you go into the future and you come back, how much more assured are you about the future than, than if I asked you to try and predict what happens today? That's what reverse engineering is all about. And if you hadn't have gone into the future and you was just looking at your present circumstances and had any self-doubt, you wouldn't have took any of that action. So that is the power of visualisation, isn't it, Ketan? Exactly. And it's the whole, whole part of it. I was there uh, as a speaker for MIT. So the irony of the fact that I was only going to Bangkok because I was asked to go and speak at a, work, a global startup workshop but it's, you know, that manifested into anything else. If I didn't take those actions, yeah, I could have gone there. I could have enjoyed myself. I could have uh, been on the on the MIT's tab, left and come home. And right now, probably scratching for my next opportunity. But actually, what did that do? The minute we started working with Thailand, Q8 came knocking on the door. And now we're reverse engineering that. We've got three or four big opportunities, which I'm currently working on based on the whole reverse engineering model. So don't underestimate what you can do with reverse engineering. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think people will find massive value. 
Can I ask what's new for Ketten, what you're working on right now? I think you may have already told us a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what, am I, what am I doing new for? Um, uh, it's, it's, as I say, there is, it's not a new me, but uh, we're, very, we're very focused right now on building um, Enterprise Lab into a platform rather than just a company it's more of an environment where I, i'm uh, we we got a lot more people on the ground now uh, for, from a team perspective um what's coming ahead is very much this whole thing about um the un's sdgs the sustainable goals um this is where my heart's going this is where i want to be i want to be able to afford more time to to start working on some of these sustainable goals uh, we're focused predominantly on goal eight and goal nine, which is about um, job creation or job uh, jobs for everyone and about innovation infrastructure. So, um, yeah, the next year is going to be an interesting uh, year for me in the fact that um, I'm going more on personal missions rather than the business mission. But um, it's it's carrying on also that 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 conveying message that um of our core values at enterprise lab which is challenge convention create imbalance and keep taking action if you can do all th those three you will become very disruptive and if you become disruptive you will be able to change results so that's that's what we're on you've got an event coming up as well haven't you with beiju yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm off to Phoenix on the um, on on Thursday next Thursday for meltdown in the desert. Hopefully, the, the, it won't melt down the way it did. But if it does, well, that's what we're going to have to do. And then on the 28th, we're 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 back in London for the um, Change Your Game event. So, if any of you are out there that um, not sure about this, go and we'll get the links and stuff sorted out for you guys. But or, or I'll get Mark to put the links in you can book yourself through you know come and spend a day with some entrepreneurs understanding how to change change your game your inner game your outer game all all, all, all parts of strategy i know mark's been been at that event that's where we met of, of all places basically so that's the first point we've had our connections i'll be there giving a talk about reverse engineering but there to also kind of be on hand to to take a little bit of one-to-one -one time with anyone that wants to uh, that wants that on how to really make make this happen um so check out the links for that on the 28th of june and hopefully i'll see some of you that are watching this there finally ketting can you tell people how they can connect with you can you share any links below for people the best way for people to follow you or to connect with you <laughs> yeah i think i mean okay i mean I'm, I'm not that hard to find on most social, social streams uh one because i have this beautiful face but second is uh is very much around my name um i spend a lot of time on either facebook or, or linkedin so actually if you if you want to connect and you want to sort of get on come find me on linkedin um connect with me there otherwise all the social streams best one is either facebook uh or um you can join on twitter it's at ketten underscore mcquana but um get in touch, you know, come through the website at enterpriselab.co.uk, just come and, you know, contact, reach out. It is me that picks up the messages as much as we have a team around because I'm still very much around being a first point contact with, with people. And um, not that I ever regret saying this right now, but if there is anything that I can do to help or if there's any sort of advice that I can give, I'm more of an open book rather than um, anything else. So come and ask a question come and hang out, come and tell me your story. If there's anything that I can do to support you in, in your journeys, guys, um, you know, your net worth is equal to your network. So just come and ask. And that's incredible of you to offer that. And I've thoroughly enjoyed interviewing you. I've really enjoyed learning all your tips, your wisdom. And I think people will have found so much value. Anyone watching, please share the broadcast. Give Ketan a like. Thank you, Ketan. I really appreciate your time today. No, you're very welcome. And as I say, Mark, right from the beginning, it's an absolute honour to come on. Thank you very much. I'm really, really, really pleased that you've got this going on with, you know, for your audiences and, and, and the people that you have. And I've seen the pedigree of the people that are coming through here. So it's an absolute honour to, to, to be on. And yeah, I hope to, hope to be again on again soon. We'll catch up soon, Ketan. Thank you. Take care and have a wonderful evening. Thanks now.
Bye-bye. Bye-bye.